Thank you, Anna. Um, welcome to this uh, midday webinar um, hosted by ICPSR and presented by the by iAssist. Um, we have a great presentation today on free and open source qualitative analysis tools. Our two presenters are Beth Duckles and Vicki Steves. Um, and I just want to mention that this is a webinar series. So this is one webinar in a series of webinars that iAssist puts on um, tackling issues around um, professional development for those in our communities and uh, research tools on um, data management, data curation, data digital preservation, data archiving, um, many topics. Um, so if you are new to the ISS community, I welcome you to check us out um, for more than just this webinar. And with that, I will turn uh, the presentation over to Vicki. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as as uh, you said, I'm Vicki Steves. I am an academic librarian in the United States and a member of the TAGET team. And I'm so happy I'm joined by Beth, if you want to unmute and introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, my name is Beth Duckles. Um, I'm a uh, research consultant, and um, I'm really thrilled to be a part of the QCoder team. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm sure some folks in this group know a little bit about qual, but um, I'm going to give it over to Beth to sort of walk through a little bit about qualitative and the landscape. We will talk uh, about each of our tools, and then we'll be sure to leave plenty of time for questions. Yeah, great. So um, I think this audience probably doesn't need a full discussion of qualitative data analysis, but we just like to give a, a kind of beginning start to this to talk a little bit about what what we're talking about. So a lot of us find ourselves um, with uh, textual data, interview transcripts, public documents, focus groups, uh, transcripts, open-ended survey questions, any kind of textual data. And I think both Vicki and I are, have, have seen the, the, the landscape of qualitative data analysis uh, software programs. Uh, typically, the, the sort of simplest part of this is that there's a close reading of this qualitative data and the computer-aided part of it is the researchers are going to assign codes or themes relevant to those codes and then put them together with the pieces within their text. Um, we, we like to talk about this in terms of, you know, a lot of this is very interpretive and there are a variety of different perspectives that people are using to bring to this. So different modes and methods and ways of thinking about how to do coding and what kind of, uh, how much iteration in coding, et cetera. We are very clear, of course, that anything that's automatic is not qualitative research. So in other words, if it's just going to give us a word cloud or going to give us counts of numbers, that's not what we're talking about. Um, so there's very much an interaction between the individual person who's the, the researcher and the, the textual data and how they do the interpretation of it. Go to the next slide. So one of the things that we, uh, both both uh, Vicki and I at, at different times and other folks I'm sure have seen is that there's, there's a landscape of coding out there, coding software out there, and these are just a few examples. We've got many more and they're quite expensive. Um, and this is, this is a challenge as we'll talk about. We were trying to come up with something that would do the basics of the things that we're interested in having. So basic coding, basic kind of, of, of connection between a code and a, um, a textual piece. Uh, and so um, I'll just let it go into, so maybe Vicki, you could go into the, the next slide and jump into why we were thinking of doing uh, free and open source. Did you want to go ahead or oh I can go ahead. Um, so the um, the reality is that there's an equity problem with a lot of these tools for folks who are um, just starting out who are maybe in graduate school who um, you know don't have uh, under resourced dis disciplines places where there's not necessarily a lot of uh, money for paying for these tools. Um, and some of the geographic areas I've heard from folks in Africa and other parts of the world where there's not as many resources to support for paying these tools. People will default to things like spreadsheets and I don't know if you've seen them, but I've seen them all over the place, even in industry as well. 
And what this does is it means that we tie up um, very complex uh, information into tools and make it impossible for other people to necessarily follow the steps that somebody uses to do their qualitative analysis. Um, there's, I can't tell you how many times I've seen and actually done myself or worked with people who have used spreadsheets or their own versions of databases to solve the problems of qualitative data analysis. There's also a challenge with lock-in, which is that, uh, you know, the export options are varied and there's not a clear standard about exporting. And this means that researchers are then stuck in a particular type of platform, especially if it was the one that you use, say, in graduate school or for a particular project. And then it's very hard to get that information out so that you can use it in another platform. Absolutely. And I would just add to that that this is not only a problem of freedom and being able to switch across platforms, but also when you're doing your scholarship and all of a sudden you can't access work you've already done, that just gets doubly problematic. So folks who, who just don't even have access to their, their own work, for instance, if they're doing it in graduate school or moved institutions, this can become a real problem. Um, some other problems is that there's a lot of complexity in the landscape. As I'm sure you saw from the last dueling cactus iAssist webinar, many of the paid qualitative data analysis packages have a lot of a lot going on that tend to overwhelm newcomers. I see a lot in my job when we're trying to teach uh, different qualitative researchers, even the basics of getting data in and coding in some of these larger qualitative packages it's a really heavy lift for a lot of them. And the, often what they just need is sort of the basic functionality of, of textual coding. So the, the crazy visualization and statistical options that a lot of these QDA packages offer, which are great for uh, advanced users, often really overwhelm newcomers. So we saw sort of a need for a little bit more minimalism and uh, user friendliness in the landscape. And this is something that we can iterate on with a uh, with an open source. So Floss, I should have mentioned. I'm sorry, is free uh, Libra open source. Um, so that's an idea that uh, it's a little bit more left than just open source. It's totally free. And then there are some emerging initiatives to sort of create these standards, but the core of a lot of the work is around um, open code books. So this is uh, code you would use for your qualitative analysis and then sort of the definition and reasoning behind it. And sharing those makes it easier to build on existing research. And um, I, we think standardizing this approach amongst uh, our packages and some of the open source can go a long way in sort of transparency for qualitative research. And I'll, I'll just add to that too um, briefly. You know, I think that one of the, I work a lot with some, with scientists and folks who are working in quantitative um, data analysis. and. One of the ways to make it um, easier to understand how qualitative research can be built upon each other is to make open code books. And I feel really passionately about that because I do believe, you know, qualitative research can always be reproduced in the way that we think of quantitative research, but we can build upon one another's code books and start from the codes that already exist elsewhere instead of starting from, from scratch. Um, and obviously that can be, that can vary depending on your orientation towards qualitative research, but I feel like it's a very easy lift for us to share one another's code books, especially in this day and age where you can just put something on the internet or put it in a Git repository or something. Um, so I feel like that's another kind of direction is to, to really ask for folks to put more code books uh, more available so that they can be used and shared. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes neatly into some of the, the challenges, which is, frankly, a lot of the technology. Um, so the one thing that is really missing that we've seen in the qualitative landscape is really the ability to collaborate. If you ever had to merge projects in some of these larger um, qualitative analysis packages, it is really complex. Um, to, to do that and to sort of calculate intercoder reliability from like three or four different uh, projects that you then have to merge all together. So there are some just uh, challenges that are existing in the landscape that I think no matter what would sort of translate to challenges in the floss landscape. Um, the ability to uh, track changes over time is a really interesting challenge that could probably be met by a lot of these, especially the approach that Beth and I took lends itself really well, so I'm excited to talk about that. 
And then there are just some cultural challenges for uh, adoption of tools that we've seen across disciplines. Um, there are, especially for qualitative research though, there are these concerns over privacy of data. So, um, you know, it's, it's very oftentimes very sensitive materials and people wanna ensure that um, it's being taken care of no matter what tool that they're loading it into. For instance, we just got a tweet today at the Taget account asking if Taget encrypts data, which it doesn't, um, although you can encrypt your drive. But this just, I think, is emblematic of sort of the larger concerns of the qualitative community that um, any tool would have to address. And then uh, the training and easy setup is another point. So for, again, as I mentioned, one of the one of the existing challenges for paid QDA softwares is that they are very complex and overwhelming. So any any of the open tools should ideally be the foil, extremely easy to set up, um, GUI based, so nothing that would require anyone to touch a terminal, for instance, um, just sort of tapping into the existing culture and uh, skills and levels of the community of researchers we're hoping to serve um, and to be able to, to uh, get that adoption easily. So there have been some past qualitative initiatives that we wanted to point to, things like RQDA, um, which I've I've tried to use it recently. It's it's been unsupported. <laughs> the last these uh, years here were the last time a release was made. So that you can see there's Aquad, which is the most recent, but um, there have been sort of attempts to to do this in the past that uh, have since dropped off. And so there's now this existing gap in the qualitative tool kit writ large um, that that Beth and I have been trying to address with the tools we're gonna to talk about QCoder and TechEd. But um, just a nod at these sort of past open initiatives for tools. That said, there are some current initiatives that are really exciting and I think uh, dovetail really ni ni nicely with what Beth was saying about open code books. This is the qualitative data repository. So we're uh, really psyched to see this. It is um, a repository for the safe publishing of qualitative data run at Syracuse University. And what's really interesting, particularly for, for tool building, is their initiative called the Annotation for Transparent Inquiry. So this is basically an initiative where people annotate existing manuscripts of research uh, with elements like analytic notes. So things like, this is how I decided to code um, family in this text, or this is uh, where I really changed my framework. Um, and with links to the data. And what's really interesting for, I think, our purposes of, of building toolkits for qualitative analysis is how do these open initiatives, how can they be supported and uplifted in our work? And likewise, so for instance, um, with QCoder, you can uh, see in, and export the entire project on your computer. It would be really neat to see an analytic note with a link to a QCoder project. So these are some just existing open initiatives that could provide awesome scaffolding to even further um, make transparent qualitative research at large, which is something as you can probably gather that Beth and I are both very passionate about um, and we think is key for reproducibility for, for qualitative. So now I'll pass it to Beth to talk a little <laughs> about QCoder. Um, yeah, it's good for us to go first because um, I think uh, we, we've, we've got a lot of stuff to share, but I do think that Tagat has a little bit more uh, kind of out of the box functionality, but I'll, I'll talk about QCoder and, and where, where it came from. Um, and I'm just going to give a nod to both Dan Scholler and Elin Waring, and especially Elin in particular, she's, um, she's sort of the mastermind behind all of this. She's, she's done a lot of the coding and the work on creating this package. Um, so we we met at the Our Open Sci Unconference, which is um, through Our Open Sci. They're uh, dedicated to creating open and reproducible research using shared data and uh, reusable software. Um, it's this incredible conference where a bunch of folks got, get together and just chat with one another and then start doing kind of a hackathon where we work together. And Dan is an anthropologist, Elon and I are both sociologists, and we were all sitting there saying, what could we do and what 
um, what, what might we put forward? And all of us knew that there was a, a need for qualitative research or qualitative packages. So we sat down and created a prototype. We've been iterating on that prototype since then. Um, and our goal is really to make it a lightweight, open source, textual, qualitative coding package in R. Um, and if you don't know what R is, it's a statistical package. Um, it's open source as well. Um, our open side does an awful lot of, of uh, package development to, to support folks in creating um, more robust packages, to check the packages, to make sure that they're doing what they need to, um, and to put them out uh, more globally. So our interest was, was in doing that. Um, we also, part of the reason for this was that we were interested in connecting the dots between some of the um, the new things coming out in R. There's a, a bunch of folks that are interested in things like text mining and sentiment analysis. And so the ability to connect the dots between the kind of work that they were doing with um, typical, you know, iterative coding that you might see in qualitative in qualitative research and in anthropology and, and um, sociology in particular. What we found, which was interesting, is we talked to a bunch of folks um, both in that community and more broadly, and found that there are a lot of folks that are doing qualitative research that do want to connect the dots with other kinds of analyses. So we thought that would be a good fit. Um, we can go to the next page. So um, I'm I'm going to give you just kind of a brief overview of the of the package. I will say it's it's definitely functional now. Um, it's it's in development and certainly has some challenges with it. So we are uh, looking for more folks to support us in that. What we're doing is using R Studio and Shiny, which is a way to create an interface on the um, in the browser to do an interactive front end interface for users. So in other words, you can point and click and you can um, highlight things and then be able to code them that way. We support doc, docx and text files at the moment. Um, our hope is to do more than that, but at the moment that's what we're focused on. Really, it's for folks who are more comfortable with the command line, which is something that we talked about as 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 a difficulty if it's not something that you're super comfortable with it's it's more challenging but the data does remain local on your computer it doesn't go anywhere um, it's going to stay in your in your file system so part of what we have there is a, is a file system to be able to um, show you where your data is you can go to the next one um, as you can see, this is an example of it. This is Elin's version of the QCoder project, the sample project that you can do if you walk through the steps in our um, GitHub repository. Uh, so in other words, what we're, we have is an, as an output is a code ID on the left. So you get code ID and then the code. In this case, we were using as our sample data set codes of conduct for conferences and just trying to um, come up with basic codes that you might put in there. So this would be the code book here, you can see where you have the code say harassment and then the description of that code um, so that the output would then be able to um, to be a, a, a um, CSV file that would be able to um, give you those codes in that way. And the next one, please. So obviously there are some challenges with QCoder. Uh, it does require at this point some knowledge of R and the RStudio interface. Once you get up and running, there it's point and click, but there is a little bit of uh, initial work that's required to do that. We don't have as much uh, capacity for collaboration, but I think it's still quite possible to create ways to make that collaboration more effective. Um, and that's certainly on the docket for the next thing we might do. We also, as I said, do need to support more file types. Um, it's uh, on GitHub under our OpenSci Labs, meaning that it's still in a laboratory format. So please feel free to see it and, and take a look if you can. Um, and we're also looking for collaborators and funds for development. Um, any Anybody interested in supporting this project or even using it? We've had a couple of folks that have been able to do some quick uh, projects and that's pretty gratifying, gratifying to see. So um, if any folks want to uh, add to this or support this project, we're very much interested in any kind of support you might be interested in, so. Yeah, and I'll just say too, I have a student who came into the library where I work um, who's a PhD in social work using QCoder to complement the other statistical work that she's doing in R. So mm -hmm. it's been a really, she said it was a blessing for her multi-method study in yeah. that she could just stay in the RStudio interface and have all of her tidyverse and then all of her qualitative analysis right there. So definitely been helpful for a lot of folks that I know who are, who are doing multi-methods with R. Um, that's fantastic. I love yeah. hearing that. See, that's exactly what we want. And we want it to be built upon as well. I think that's really 
our goal is to, in the very much the free and open source kind of world, we really want this to be generative and for other people to take it in directions we hadn't thought of. So, yeah. Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Tagit. I'm hoping to talk for 10-ish, 15-ish minutes, and then we'll give plenty of time for people who want to ask us any questions. Um, Tagit is like baguette, but with a T. Um, it was developed by Remy Rampin, who is a research engineer in New York City. Um, the origin story of Tagget is simply that I was complaining for two whole years about how expensive qualitative software was. And Remy was like, all right, what do you actually need it to do? And I was like, highlight some text and assign a tag to it. And then Tagget was born. Um, so this is just some of the functionality that comes with Tagget. Um, it's a desktop application, but it can also be run on a server um, for collaboration purposes. Uh, we can uh, import lots of different types of text files. We're working on AV, but it's not yet possible. And then, uh, like the image implies, it is simply just highlighting and tagging, really basic qualitative analysis, so nothing, nothing fancy. Um, so it works on any type of computer, so you can just install it um, pretty much wherever you want. Um, all the data is stored in a SQLite database that's on your computer, so it, the data also remains local. Um, if you are interested in collaborating on real time, you can install it on a server, as I said, and we also provide a server for you at app.taget.org. So if you want to try it out, but you uh, before you commit to using it, you can feel free to just make an account for free and use it there. Um, as I said, you can install it from there. It will pop up in your list of applications like normal. We actually found one person, one university who is self-hosting Tagget. And I wanted to uh, put this into the world because I would definitely love to see other institutions do this as well, where you can see they have a tagget.s ice.indiana.edu. Um, so I don't know what that is. I think it's a school of information actually, but um, I can envision some really cool use cases where universities uh, install Tagget on a secure server. So for folks working with HIPAA and FERPA or secure data, they can have a place on their university to actually do the analysis without having to uh, have a password encrypted drive everywhere they go. So that's my dream of dreams. Any of you uh, in the audience want to make that happen, hit me up. Um, so then I thought I would demo a little bit about how Tagit works. In the slides, I have everything I'm going to show you really explicitly, but I thought I would just go ahead and um, show you what Tagit looks like. So when you start Tagit, you should notice this command line pop up don't touch it. Uh, it is basically there be, um, to serve as the server for Tagget. So you can see it's running locally. That's the local host. Because it's a desktop application, it's running in single user mode. So just me. And I have no projects yet. So with Tagget, everything happens sort of in a web browser. We recommend you use Firefox and Chrome, although we just pushed a fix for Safari. Um, Although again, probably should stick to Firefox and Chrome. So I can name my study anything I want. I can change it, awesome study. I can give it a nice description, interviewing cool people about neat things. Ah. And when I create it, you're brought to your project. So it's project number one on this computer. Um, and again, all of this is what goes into your database. So you can see over here, for instance, if I wanted to change this to an underscore, it changes automatically. So you can just sort of change things at will. Um, Tagat uses Calibri, which is an ebook manager, to do all of the um, conversions for documents. So anything that Calibri takes as input, Tagat will take as input. So I thought I would just show uh, a little bit about the interesting functionality. So here, to add a document, you upload things, find out where you put a, a document. By default, it will populate with your uh, name, but you can change it to something like subject 2102. 
uh, and you can add in some uh, description. It's not required, but it is, um, for best practices, a good approach. So I might say something like interviewee or something more descriptive if I was a good person. So then Taget will uh, convert the document into HTML so that when I click on it here, it shows up in the pane. So you can see that some of the formatting is stripped away, like this is, should have been on a new line and this is uh, upper um, superscript, but uh, some things just uh, get washed out in the conversion. So in Taget, you will always be working on either the left or the right hand side. So the left hand side has like all your project info, your tags, and the right hand side will show, um, for instance, I clicked on this, there are no highlights, so nothing shows up. It will show whatever you click on on the left. So I'll just show a little bit about how to actually do the analysis. I'll show you some exports um, and we can, again, have time for questions. So to create a tag with Taget, you just highlight the section of text. You see this new highlight uh, pop up near my cursor. If you click on that, you can assign a tag or for instance, create a new one such as adoption. And I might say that that is the rate of reproducible practices. And this is what goes into your code book, this description and this tag. So you wanna make sure it's something you'll understand later. When I click save and close, I can add that tag. And now you will see this bright yellow highlight and that is uh that is how you simply create tags and tag it um i will also say that you can upload materials in any language we've had people work in vietnamese arabic chinese japanese it, within tag it. so you can upload any materials in any language but um, the interface will not change so things will always be sort of left oriented um like the this will stay on the left, so that's just a caveat. One thing that is weirdly really popular with Taget, with whenever I demo this to, to potential users, qualitative researchers, is this feature called Backlight, which is basically graying out the text, except what you've highlighted as a way to get a different view of your materials. So I always just show that because it gets a lot of gasps, weirdly enough, when, in the classes where I teach this. Um, but is an interesting way to view the other uh, highlights and materials that you're going to be working with. You'll notice that if I hover over the highlight, it shows the tag that I have assigned to it, so adoption. You can edit those as you want. So for instance, I might create a tag that says rate of reproducible. As I'm going through, um, if you refresh and go there, you should see the one now, yep. Um, as I'm going through, I might say to myself, well, the rate of reproducible research is the same as adoption. So I might wanna merge these tags together, which is a really common feature of qualitative research as you're iteratively coding and recoding, you inevitably sort of squash categories together. So when you hit edit, you can either choose to delete the tag, or let's say I have 50 things coded. When you hit merge, you simply just select what you'd like it uh, to be merged into. And now everything that would have been tagged with adoption with rate reproducible is in adoption, which was nothing for this, but you know, in your analysis could be any number of, of tags. So all of the views on the right hand side are all exportable. So you can see there's always an export this view here. Um, when you are looking at individual highlights, you will always see the document where it came from and the highlight that you have uh, put onto it. So for instance, if I click this and add interesting, let's just say, this is also interesting. Do a little coding on the fly in front of everyone. Oop. We go to our highlights and say, for instance, see all highlights. You'll notice that this, that previously only had adoption, now has interesting. So you can code multiple and they'll show up here. Um, and this is just one way that we can sort of ex uh, view our work. For instance, if we just clicked interesting, you would only see the tags highlights with interesting, which happens to be both, or adoption with just the one. 
So now that we know sort of how to see our documents, how to see different codes, it's uh, for our purposes and the purposes of sharing, it's really interesting to export these things. So you might first want to export the code book so you can send it to a collaborator or uh, publish it with your data in the qualitative data repository. If you click export code book, you'll notice you have a number of options, uh, including the QDC, which is um, the part of the Rotterdam Exchange. So if you export your code book as this QDC, you can then import it into Atlas TI and Vivo, Max QDA, whatever paid software your collaborator might be using. And then you'll notice some of the other standard ones like Excel, CSV, so those are all spreadsheets. HTML, if you wanna make it a website for whatever reason, doc to make it editable or PDF. So if we click CSV, we open it with LibreOffice. You should, we should see that, oops, it becomes a spreadsheet with our tag, our tag and our description. We can also do that with all of the highlights. If you click see all highlights and export this, uh, export the view, you can uh, see all your highlights in addition uh, to use with your code book. So once you have your code book and after uh, next, you might want to export all the things you've tagged. You can do that with like docx. And if we save it, I can pop it open to show you all, which is all of our tags. Oops. And then you can send it. So it will always tell you the document and always tell you all the tags in addition to the quote. They will be separated by this horizontal line. Um, and that's one way. You can also highlight this view of the document. And for instance, if you, uh, if you export this as like doc and then open it, you will actually see all the highlights. Just the problem, the caveat that we always give with that is that you won't see the actual text of the tag. So you can get the document and you can show where it's highlighted, but again, you won't see which tags go to which highlights. Um, and this is something that we are actively working on as a part of our development. So this is a little bit about what Tagit looks like. You can always delete whatever projects you want, add codes, create new ones from this interface or as you're tagging. And then always everything is exportable. The one thing that isn't exportable necessarily that we're working on is the full project. So since it is a database, we can export it to XML pretty easily, which is what we would need to import it into like Max QDA, Atlas TI, things like that. Um, the problem is, is getting it to match with the, with the QDPX standard. So the standard has some documentation questions that we're still trying to answer uh, before we can let uh, users, for instance, export the whole project to be um, somewhere else. So that is what Teget looks like. And again, all these slides are really detailed. So if you miss something, if you wanted me to go slower, you have a very in-depth workflow. That's how Teget looks like with Arabic, for instance. Um, but everything here, everything I've talked about, you will be able to go back and go through here. I also wanted to highlight some features that are only on the server version of Tagat. Um, that is uh, adding collaborators. Obviously, if you're in single user mode, you can't add a collaborator. But if you are on app.tagat.org, which is our free server, or if you have installed it on your own server at your institution, then you can add people to specific projects with different levels of permissions. So for instance, you might have a grad student who is responsible for coding some documents, but you don't want them to be able to delete your project. So that would be the view and make changes that's highlighted in that image there. The other thing that is on the server that is not yet on the desktop, which we're gonna hopefully be porting there soon, is how to switch the language of the interface. So generous volunteers have translated Taget's actual interface into multiple languages. Um, some are listed here, French, Spanish, Italian, German, uh, Netherlandish, Dutch, that's what it is. Um, and we have a lot of uh, 
translations in progress at this link. So Japanese is started, Vietnamese is started, Czech is started. So if any of you speak those languages, it would be a huge help to us if you would click that link and help translate some of the parts of Tagit. The other side of the things that we do is we have a few different um, guides and resources for sort of community outreach and support. So we get a lot of questions for troubleshooting at our inbox, hi at tagget.org. Um, you can always feel free to reach out to us there or open an issue right in our GitLab where we're doing all the development. We have a getting started guide. All of our educational materials and presentations are on the OSF at that link. We have two different listservs, one for the users of Tagit. So if you have a question about um, someone else's usage of Tagit, like how did you code integrator reliability in Tagit, that uh, listserv might be a good place for you. Or if you just want to get some announcements, like when we have a new version of Tagit open, that's the listserv for announcements there, this uh, Tagit announce. And then as always, feel free to tweet at us at Tagit Project. So we wanted to be sure to leave time for questions for all of you. So just a brief summary, qualitative research has been traditionally sort of pencil and paper, which is fine if you still do that, or really dominated by lockdown, expensive proprietary software. And we saw this and didn't think it was fair. And so uh, we have tried to address this gap of free and open software for qualitative research with QCoder and Tagit. Um, we mentioned in our little table of the cactus landscape that there's also Qualcoder. Uh, Qualcoder is another free and open source software that works on Linux and Windows, and they actually have support for AV. So if you're doing AV stuff, you should definitely check out Qualcoder as well. Um, so feel free to read more and try out our tools at those links or get in touch on Twitter or by those emails there. Um, so that's what we have for all of you, and we would be delighted to take any of your questions. And Amy, are you facilitating questions in the chat or do people unmute? Hey there, this is Anna. I can help facilitate some of those questions. Um, great, so our first question is, let me just pull this out. The first question is, uh, do your tools work with the new ReFi QDA open standards for projects, codebooks, et cetera? Yeah, so Tagget works with the codebook of that standard and we are trying to uh, also work with the project side of that standard so this is the rotterdam exchange uh format for qualitative research um and the documentation for the code book was really easy to follow but for projects it's a little bit more um complicated so for instance they sort of mandate everything should be in uh, pdf and so there's um some parts of actually the XML project schema that have been a little more difficult to work with. So um, that's just been a heavier lift for us in terms of development. But yeah, so we support the code book and we want to support the project and that work is ongoing. Yeah, we at QCoder, I know that Elon has been working on this. Um, they, uh, they're, we're doing some research to implement that. I do know that we um, we want to very much, but it's um, it's still a work in progress for us. Um, yeah, we have a slightly different data model, so because of that, it does make it a little bit more challenging. But we do very much want to be a part of that. So great. I see uh, another question just popped up right here. Does Tiget enable hierarchical coding uh, subcategories under a main category? Yeah, so um, if you are in Tiget, then you can use punctuation in your tags to indicate hierarchy. So that's, for instance, if you have tech underscore floss or tech underscore proprietary, then that actually makes it a hierarchical code. So then tech would be the parent 
and at everything after the punctuation would be the child. We are working on implementing that in a tree view. So um, like the plus and the minus, and you would see all the nested components, um, stuff like that. So while it actually works, it just won't necessarily appear to the users that it is hierarchical. So um, yeah, just use punctuation after the parent code, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned collaboration and uh, the somewhat cumbersome nature of project merging. Um, the question is about, is there native collaboration features in these tools? Yeah, so for Taget, um, you can collaborate if you have it on a server or if you use our server at app.taget.org. Um, so I'll just, Pop that in. So this is what it looks like app.tagget.org. You have some login. And when you see that, for instance, these are all of my, um, this one is, uh, you can add collaborators of, of varying permissions. So if I wanted to add Remy there, I could say full permissions and add to the project. Um, this only works because I'm on app.tagget.org. Um, or if you were uh, to self-host it on a server, then you would have that functionality as well. But on the desktop, there is no collaboration, like just the straight up desktop version. Yeah, we don't uh, we don't support that in QCoder at the moment. I know that um, the sort of the mindset is that we would consider Git as a kind of version control and potentially that would be the way that you would go about. Obviously, there are challenges with doing that. Um, I think ours is a is a, a again lightweight so we're really focused on that i think in the long term if we could get more resources we'd love to try to integrate more ways to create collaboration so great um next question is there a limit on the number of documents or other other measure that can be uploaded to tiget no if your document is too big, it might hang for a little while, but there's no hard and fast limit. Like if you're uploading something into your browser that is a gigabyte, it will take a long time, but barring that. Okay, great. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much for all of the kudos. We've seen a lot of, this is amazing, and we really appreciate that. Um, another group who benefit from FLOSS is public libraries. Um, PLs are conducting research but don't have access to academic tools. So thank you for that note. Um, another question is, how do you handle overlapping codes? Um, I assume that's like when you assign the same tag to the same like section of text. Um, and in that case, we, uh, as you can see here, we already have um, a section of text with two codes. So you just see both of them. I hope that's what that means. Beth, is that what it sounds yeah, like that, to you? Yeah, that's, that's what it sounds like to me. It's, it's similar for, um, for QCoder. We talked a lot about kind of the challenge of nesting codes. We do have a strategy for, so you can add as many tags to each section as you'd like. So you can multiple code any piece of, of um, any quote that you use. Um, beyond that, I think, I, I actually, I think we've solved the, the nested code problem, as I recall, um, meaning that you have like, say, one big long block of code, and then within that, you've got a shorter piece of text. So you can have multiple codes within one another like that. Um, and I don't know that there's a limit to that, to be honest. Um, it's mostly just about getting the, yeah, I think, I think, I, I know that we have a strategy for that. That was one of our concerns as we were developing it, so. Uh, this is a fun question. How many colors are there for highlighting? <laughs> oh, I wish I had a better answer, which is just yellow, um, <laughs> because we've been grappling with the problem of when you have overlapping codes, what should the color be? Um, so if you give like interesting the color red and tech the color purple, what if and if you assign that to to one section of text, what should the color be? 
So once we have an answer to that question, we will implement colors for highlighting. So right now, unfortunately, just yellow. But if you have good ideas about that, let us know. We we're thinking about gradients for a while, but it might get a little complicated. Yeah, we just have one color. I'd love more colors. I think it'd be great. Uh, I know one one sort of earlier version of this, this wasn't free and open source, but uh, some folks were using annotations, which is a now defunct um, package in, in uh, or not even package, it's an application for Mac and uh, Mac OS. Anyway, they had a lot of colors and that was one of the things I really enjoyed about it was that you could change the color of things. So I, I, I think it's really helpful. Obviously, um, I'd love to see more of it in, in see it in in our our piece but we we definitely have other things that we're working on first so yeah and the other side of it is i really dislike the sidebar that exists in a lot of qualitative software so my problem with colors is also how do you balance like overlapping codes not only in terms of merging colors together or something mm -hmm. but um yeah how to deal with doing that without a sidebar so mm -hmm. again uh, feedback is welcome on that. I love it. That's great. Um, have you seen use of T for indexing of proper names and or concepts? Um, and then a follow up is and Q coder. Uh, I assume this means like pulling out just specifically proper names. I'm not entirely sure what this question is asking. Beth, do you? No, I don't have any sense of this, honestly. Um, yeah, I'd love more clarification. Yeah, if you're talking about like named entity recognitions, oh, I see it's Peter. Hi, Peter. Um, if you're talking about like pulling out specific entities of text, um, I assume that people have tried that. But it, as we mentioned earlier, nothing is automatic. It's all people sitting there and, and doing a close reading. So for automatically indexing things, no. For qualitative research that might uh, that might show that, yes. Great. Um, I think you may have answered this already, but can Tiget be used online without installing it on a local server? Yes, absolutely. So that's what I was showing earlier with single user mode. Um, so when you see this in the top right hand corner, that means that you are using Tagget on your own personal desktop. And if I was to um, so everything here, there's my little Tagget desktop application. And this is what is running in the background that you can just ignore. But when you see single user mode, that means you're running it on your local computer, no server required. Great, thank you. Is there a way to view slash export code co-occurrences in Tiget? Uh, I assume co-occurrences is like between collaborators. Or is it, or do you mean the actual occurrences of, of a code over multiple documents? Um, if that's the case, then yes, if you, uh, for instance, see all highlights. And if you export it as CSV, you'll be able to tell that adoption and interesting overlap in this text. Um, and you'll be able to do some of that uh, other, like more um, quantitative indexy type of work with whatever spreadsheet software that you have on your computer. So if I was to open this with CSV, um, I could really easily see the co-occurrences between these tags. So I hope that answers that question, Maura. Um, but if not, I'm happy okay. to answer it in more detail. All right, great. We have more questions about highlights. So to refine the currently discussed question, uh, this was from a few moments ago, can highlights only partially overlap? Beth? Um, I'm pretty sure that we, let's see, I, I, I feel I feel a little, I, I'm not entirely sure how we came to the conclusion, because I do know that, like I said, the concatenated ones where you have the larger one and the smaller within it. Um, the, the question that I, that you're asking is, can they overlap just as say that there's a couple of words this way, a couple of words that way. My understanding is that they can, but 
um, but I'd have to double check on that. I know I know we intend for that to be the functionality because I know we know the use of that, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure if we've completely fixed that right now. So, but I, I think it's there. Yeah, for Tagat, you um, you definitely can have anything overlap in any way you want. We really don't put any restrictions on on highlighting and tagging at this point. So yes. Great. Um, are there any plans for, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, it was Amy. I see it. There was a couple of questions asking about the ability to search with wildcards across documents. Huh, no, but that could probably be added pretty easily. So I will open an issue on GitLab about that. Yeah, that's a good idea. I actually didn't even think about that. So yes, thank you for that question, uh, which will hopefully turn into a feature. Yeah, I don't think we have it either, but I do think that the understanding would be that you could use a find or a search function, but I'm actually not sure that we have it within the within the package. So that's a good question. Oh, so Maura said the same two codes on multiple docs. Yes, you can use codes on whatever document um, and it will show up in that same view that I showed earlier. Um, so if I had a second document, you would see subject like 2103 and then interesting, and that is exportable in the same way. So. There's also a follow on from Peter um, where he said indexing software is expensive. So using this as a first pass for concepts to be used for creating an index, that possible. Yeah, it's a, it's a use case I hadn't considered, but it, it's really interesting. So I definitely um, would want to hear more about that. Yeah, we hadn't thought about that as a use case either. I think it's a fascinating idea though. and capturing page numbers in text? For Tagget, the page numbers will stay in there. It just might look a little weird because it's sort of like infinite scroll. So there's no pagination for the right-hand side where your document shows up. So you'll see the page number. It just won't necessarily mean anything because it'll just be like on its own line in between two paragraphs or something like that. So. The, the the one of the things that we've been trying to solve in Taget is the formatting. It's been a big problem, uh, or not a big problem, but a, a minor annoyance, I guess, um, in the way that Calibri converts things. So you can see like in this document, which is um, again, like this should be on a new line. These are superscript. Um, links get stripped out ex in some places, but not others. So some of the formatting is something we're working on. Like these are supposed to be headings. Um, so, so some of the stuff that is more reliant on the way that the HTML looks here, um, like we don't capture images at all either um, with Tagget yet, although there's an issue open for it. Um, yeah, some of the formatting will just be a little wonky, but none of the elements besides images will actually be missing. In my read, I think we've gotten through all of the questions. Um, if anyone has anything else, this is your last chance to ask, or if you feel we haven't adequately addressed a question or missed your question, because there were quite a few, this was a great discussion, thanks to the really attentive audience. I saw a question above about, is QCoder a reskinned RQDA? Um, and the answer is no, it is not. Uh, we started all over again. Uh, we did try to contact our QDA. We actually ended up finding another place, another person who had decided to come up with something called QCoder and uh, communicated with them. They hadn't finished a, a prototype. So um, we are happy to work with anyone who, um, and would love to talk to the RQDA folks, but uh, it is a different, a different package, so. Did you see that question just come in at the bottom Capt or a comment really capturing URIs would be a good idea? Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so within the text, we still have the, the URLs. Um, 
the formatting just might look off, but they're there. Great. Um, well, we have gotten to the end of our hour. Thank you for joining our webinar today to, again, this very attentive audience. Um, please join me, audience, in thanking our, our two presenters um, for a really great presentation today. Um, it's a wonderful resource. The community is clearly engaged and interested. And um, I encourage you to uh, re-listen to the webinar or uh, view the slides to get all of the really great information that was provided just so. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your great questions. Yes, really appreciate it. Bye, all. Bye.